So hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to our session about prioritizing researcher perspectives and driving adoption for research data management. It's much louder. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. Didn't know you were talking. Yeah, it's OK. Um, so, so thanks, everyone, for coming to our session about prioritizing researcher perspectives and uh, research data management. We'll be talking about talking to researchers uh, about their data. Um, just to introduce ourselves. My name is John Borgi. I'm a clear postdoctoral fellow at um, California Digital Library, where I work with the UC3 team there. Um, and I do a bunch of research and outreach projects. Mostly I mention that because um, I'll be talking about a kind of data-driven approach to communicating with researchers today. So you have some idea of where I'm coming from there. <laughs> and I'm Daniela Lowenberg. I'm a research data specialist and a product manager splitting half my time between the data publication platform for the UCs and half my time as the project lead for the Make Data Count data usage metrics project with DataSite and Data One. Um, and we'll start with John's first half. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, a project that we are undertaking at, at the UC3 team, uh, developing data management tools for researchers and service providers. Um, said another way, we're looking to build a tool to help researchers and librarians talk to each other about research data. And so the, the uh, I think difficulty underlying this project is the fact that talking about research data is very difficult. Um, and it's difficult for a number of reasons. There's lots of angles on this problem, but one big reason is that there are very different stakeholders involved in research data. So we have the research community, we have institutions, libraries, uh, funders, publishers, and one, uh, not only are there these different stakeholders, but these groups are not homogeneous within themselves. So the research community is incredibly heterogeneous about how it you know, thinks about and talks about research data and all these other stakeholders are as well. And there are overlaps here. You know, People in the research community also uh, work for, with funders and publishers and the Perceptions and priorities are, are kind of messy. Um, another big difficulty is jargon. Um, so I'm a data curation postdoc. That's part of my job description. And when I talk to researchers, I have a real hard time identifying what that actually means. So there's a lot of jargon in this space, even relatively um, simple terms or terms that are very common uh, mean different things to different people. So these stakeholders, uh, may use the same words differently, may use different words for the same thing. Um, the one that I run into all the time is repository. So when I'm in a room like this, repository means a very specific thing. When I talk to researchers, often they think I'm talking about a GitHub repository. Um, metadata is like a scary word for every researcher, including me. So <laughs> um, and yeah, so um, I've actually, um, at CDL, done a little bit of informal research about this, this jargon problem. Um, we did a survey, a, a very informal survey, where we asked researchers uh, about the words that they use to describe the various kind of parts of their research process. Um, and so we asked them, what terms do you use to describe the stage of your research that involves preparing or outlining procedures for managing data? And they gave us a wide variety of responses. Um, there are a couple on here that are data management planning and research data management. And I suspect those are actually librarians um, or, or people kind of in this space rather than like a biochemistry researcher or somebody like that. But there's just a huge variety of, of how people describe um, that phase of their research project. And I think looking at this not only reveals that there are and terminology differences, but there's also some like differences in perspective about what's important that comes through here. So a lot of um, sort of experimental researchers are just defining everything in terms of like getting ready to do the actual experiment. I don't have a separate phase for this. This is my favorite one at the end. I don't have a name for this. It's just a <laughs> thing that I do. <laughs> um, and, and this kind of terminology difference um, and, and kind of complication, I think, has some real consequences. So. Um, I'm a neuroscientist by training, um, and one of the projects I'm undertaking at CDL is uh, investigating how brain imaging researchers manage their data, like through the course of an entire project. And um, while we were designing a survey and surveying researchers, we thought it would be a good idea to ask them about their interaction with the library. 
Um, and so we asked them about, I'm not going to read all three of these, but uh, basically we asked them about their interaction with data related services or library kind of services in three different ways. Uh, one focusing on technical infrastructure, one focusing on something that is kind of approximate to research data management, and something else that um, kind of scholarly communications. Uh, and in every single case, the majority of researchers said that either those services were not available to them, they were not sure if they were available to them, or if they were available to them, they had not taken advantage of them. So um, the most, most commonly people were taking advantage of like IT related services, but you can see there's kind of a steep decline. Um, and we are actually checking right now for the people who said there, they are, there are no services available to them, we're actually checking back with their institution to see if that's accurate actually accurate or not but um, what this demonstrates is there's like these large swaths of the population on a campus who are not interacting with kind of library data services um, I actually presume that most of the people who said no here are incorrect because most of these people in our sample come from very large research institutions in the United States that probably have at least some data services around um, okay so the problem here is researchers have data needs. Um, they have a particular way or many particular ways of talking about their data. We as people in the library would like to talk to them about their data, um, but that is very difficult. So there are some tools that this community has uh, devised and is using to, to make uh, that communication a little bit easier or to at least talk about data. Uh, I'm not gonna go through these in a, a lot of depth, um, but I am going to cover some of them because they have informed how we have uh, thought about our own tool. So the first, um, it would not be a you know, conference <coughs> involving libraries and data without a research data lifecycle. Uh, this is probably the most common one from data one. Um, I think this is a really nice way of showing that research data management is a thing that happens throughout the course of a research project rather than just the beginning or the end. Um, unfortunately, I think when you show this to researchers, they assume that it doesn't really apply to them because most researchers I've talked to say my data, my, my research process is not nearly this linear. It looks nothing like this. Um, it's a crazy mess of, of things going all around. And also these words are not necessarily what I use to describe these phases. And if I'm talking about, and maybe they're not even thinking about things like preservation, uh, discovery, like those kinds of things. Um, we have the data curation profiles, which is a, a inter, uh, uses some of the data lifecycle kind of terminology and, and structure to get a very comprehensive uh, view of the data going on and the data being passed around and developed and devised within a particular research group or project. Um, I think this is really great for understanding what data is, you know, around. Um, unfortunately, it takes a long time to sit down and conduct one of these or complete one of these, and it does have some jargon that if you just hand this to a researcher, they would maybe not know what you're talking about. Um, there's a lot of these now, these maturity-based frameworks um, that kind of allow for assessment of um, RDM activities or data management <coughs> services at kind of an institutional level or a benchmarking kind of tool. So this is one from ANS here on the side, um, which allows institutions to grade their uh, data management services on a level from initial to optimized and the idea is uh, the higher level you are the more organized and managed and defined things are and rather than kind of developing new things uh, in response to a need you're just optimizing existing services as things develop um, this particular one splits um, the framework into policies and procedures infrastructure support services and and metadata although there are uh, many different versions of this now that take different approaches. And there are tools that kind of combine all of these things together. Um, this is the DM Vitals tool where um, a researcher and a data curation person or a librarian can sit down and enter uh, responses to a number of prompts and get kind of autom automatic uh, recommendations about um, where that researcher should proceed with their data management activities. Uh, this is not being used very widely uh, and I don't think a researcher would be able to use this on their own although it is kind of defined uh, devised for that purpose 
Um, and taking like a step back and looking at the research community itself, it's interesting to note that the research community has adopted similar models in how it talks about research data. So this um, on the right, or on <laughs> the, the life cycle figure here is from a paper about uh, fostering reproducible, neuros uh, reproducible science. And it talks about faults and, and ways that sci uh, science can kind of go awry and become non-reproducible. And there are some data related things in here and it kind of looks like a data life cycle. Um, but you can see that the emphasis is all about kind of statistics and methodology and, and experimental research. And um, these kind of rubrics for, for grading uh, journal policies in terms of openness and, and transparency. So these are the top guidelines. Uh, have a similar structure to kind of these maturity-based tools where they are uh, uh, assessing things on a number of levels across a number of different criteria. So there are like converging models, but we're using different terminology and we're using um, kind of different perspectives. So here are the problems that we are addressing in the tool that I'm going to be talking about. Researchers are faced with constantly evolving expectations about how they should man manage and share their data. I think Danielle is going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, data stakeholders have different perspectives and use different ter terminology. And existing tools, while excellent for the purposes that they were devised for, are not always particularly user-friendly or uh, researcher-focused, which Again, they were not always advised to be researcher focused, uh, so that is okay. But uh, we are developing at CDL and at UC3 specifically an RDM guide for researchers. It will have a pithier name when it is complete, probably, uh, but for now, um, this is what we're calling it. One thing that we think a lot about is we can't call a thing that's all about, um, you know, getting away from terminology and RDM guide when that is such a hard thing to define. So. <laughs> I think here it's okay to call it that, but when we're done, uh, it'll have a different name. So the characteristics of this guide are, it's intended to help researchers and data service providers speak the same language. Um, it builds on previous efforts and our own research. Um, it emphasizes accessibility, uh, usability, and adoption, so we want to build a thing that people actually use. Um, and emphasizes flexibility and adaptability, so, so something that we think a lot about um, is the fact that researchers in different disciplines or even different career stages have different needs about data management um, and we don't necessarily want to tell them that there is one universal ideal state that they should be striving towards. Um, and you know different kind of local institutions might have different services that we want them to direct, be directed towards. So we want to build something that we can adjust and have uh, be adjusted. So the, these tools consist of two main parts and um, for a project that's gonna be accessible and usable and have some design elements right now, it kind of just looks like a grid, uh, but I will walk you through what this looks like. So central to these tools is this RDM maturity rubric. Again, it will have a pithier name and probably not use the word maturity in it when it's all complete because talking to researchers, they it's hard to talk to them that their, their practices might be immature. They don't really like that. So <laughs> we are, we're thinking through the terminology a bit. So um, just to walk, walk you through the guide. So um, vertically, it's organized in kind of a research data life cycle kind of fashion where it's talking about different activities that a researcher might uh, partake in during the course of their research. So planning a project, organizing data, saving data, getting data ready for analysis, analy analyzing data and publishing data, for example. And um, horizontally, uh, it's organized in terms of something kind of like RDM maturity, although we have categorized it as ad hoc, one time, active and informative and optimized for reuse. So the idea is, um, you know, someone who's planning in a very ad hoc basis <coughs> might have uh, a way of doing things when it comes to their data, but it's not written down anywhere, it's um, not standardized in any fashion, or <coughs> particularly documented, and as it becomes more of a one-time thing, they have a plan maybe, but they don't look at it ever again. Um, if it's active and informative, they're updating it as it goes along, and if it's optimized for reuse, 
that's exactly what it sounds like. They're, they're optimizing all of their planning activities with the idea that their data might be reused in the future, either by another researcher or by themselves. And so that's true of, of all of the, the kind of levels. Um, two things to note is we have these declarative statements at every level that puts um, what we're actually talking about in a researcher's own kind of terminology as much as we can. We've tried to get away from anything resembling jargon. Um, although if you're looking at this and say, there's some jargon in here, please just, just let me know and we'll try to take it out. Um, so th these are like active sentences, like I decide what data is important to me while I am working on it and typically save it in a single location. Um, this organization we think allows a researcher to assess themselves very quickly and easily um, on these criteria. And we are working under the assumption that not every researcher necessarily wants to be optimized for re reuse. We want them to maybe start thinking in that direction, but if they do an assessment of themselves and find that they're all doing one-time things and that's okay for their current need, um, that's just part of the communication that happens um, rather than a kind of grading or anything like that. The other thing to note is that these stages along the side are open to being rearranged or uh, at, uh, open for additions or subtractions depending on kind of what kind of work the researcher is actually doing. And I, I should also mention that when I say researcher, I mean any kind of scholar. Um, I'm an experimental researcher by training, so I kind of default to that mindset, but um, we're trying to build something as inclusive as possible for anyone doing any kind of scholarship that will necessitate some research data management. Okay, and, and so tied to each of these levels are a one-page guide. So once the researcher has um, kind of assessed the, where they are, they can open up one of these guides and learn how to advance their practice um, to the degree that they would like to or need to. So these guides, um, again, there'll be some more kind of conscious design work eventually. Um, we were just focusing on getting the content together. Um, these guides allow, or allow for whoever's reading them to understand like, what we mean by planning, uh, what we mean by defining each stage, what actually that means in practice, um, some requirements, so if there are actual requirements from funders or publishers or institutions about what needs to happen at these stages, those are in these guides, and some general points to kind of think about. Um, so for example, you know, a researcher planning their data, um, one of the things we have in the guide is that planning is not a one-time activity. So just writing a data management plan for your grant does not mean you're done with planning and don't need to refer back to your plan. It's not an iterative process, but. Um, and these are all designed to be localized as much as possible. So there's space in all of them for a local um, RDM team to put their contact information. If there's a uh, data retention policy on campus, that obviously would be incorporated into something like this. Um, we're thinking about working with disciplinary communities to develop like more specific versions of these. These are intended right now to be very general, but we would like in the future for you know, a, some kind of researcher to say like, what are the particular uh, repositories and databases and metadata schemes or whatever that apply to me? Um, we'd like to have that in there if possible. So again, flexibility and adaptability. So in terms of outputs, um, we are working right now to design the physical collateral that will go along with this. So. Uh, there's going to be a postcard with a much fancy, uh, prettier version of the guide on it with some information on the back that a librarian can hand to a researcher and kind of facilitate a conversation like that. Um, also brochures including the kind of one page guide material. Uh, pretty soon I'll start writing a publication describing the development of this project. Um, so the community of, of like librarians and, and data curation folks can, can read that. Um, we're also, yeah, like I said, developing tools um, for <coughs> developing discipline or institution specific versions. So right now, if someone wants to create a local version, they would have to come through us, but we would like it to be that they could download our templates and add in their own versions if they'd like. And I'm trying to be as transparent as possible uh, as this project is developed. So there's <coughs> a blog post coming soon. There have been blog posts throughout the whole thing, um, project updates. 
um, just keeping people apprised of what's going on and allow for feedback at every stage. We've had a lot of conversation through blog posts about the difference between data sharing and data publishing, for example, and, and like terminology that is important to have some operational definition of moving forward. And I would like to, I guess, end this by um, just noting that we're always seeking input and collaboration. So I'm happy to sit down and talk more about this with anybody who wants to. My email address will be at the end. Um, happy to collaborate or talk through this more. Okay, thanks. Great. So. One more. One more. One more. Oh. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned, part of my job is promoting data publishing uh, for the UCs and globally. And I came into this position about 10 months ago um, after working for four years at PLOS, uh, starting the open data policy there. And so I come from a position of not a lot of pushback because you have to open your data to publish the paper and coming into a job where I'm overseeing a data publication platform and I'm not seeing any adoption. And why am I not seeing adoption? It doesn't have to do with the technology. So we talk a lot about the sticks and carrots of open data publishing. We talk about how there's funder and publisher mandates, there's doing the right thing, there's reproducibility and transparency, but there's something we're not talking about when we talk about sticks and carrots. Let's start with sticks. The PI is the one submitting the DMP plan the grad student or postdoc is the one who's doing the research and is responsible for publishing the data. So the grad student might not know that the PI put in the DMP that the data is gonna be published or never released. And then when the grad student goes to publish and they say, okay, to my PI, I really need to open up this data set so that we can get our paper published or, oh, I wanna open this up because I think it's the right thing. The PI could say, I had no idea and our lab doesn't do that. So there's this huge disconnect between the sticks. Doing the right thing is that we keep talking about how we need to open up data, people need to reuse it, we should be doing data citations and giving credit. Absolutely true. But right now, tenure committees aren't looking at data citations or opening up your data. And so we're saying do the right thing, but researchers aren't being rewarded for that yet. We say that open data has a huge success right now. We talk about all the publishers that have opened up thousands of data sets and how many there are out there. Um, but as I know from being a publisher, if the researcher wasn't prepared to do this, they could just submit a figure and put it up in Figshare or an SI file and we'd say that's open data. But how do we know that's the data? Uh, similarly, we talk about how many how many submissions there are in Figshare and Open Science Framework and all these places. But an example is we put all of our presentations from CNI in Open Science Framework. So how do we know how many actual data sets? If we look through these repositories, how many data sets and how much of it is actual reusable data, fair data, not just things that you're putting up to fulfill a requirement? And we know that these resources are not adoption focused. There's a lot of jargon like John was talking about, but we're really focusing on tools and technology. Even just now I was going through Twitter and seeing that there's a lot of talk at CNI about you know, the technology backends, but where are the researchers in the room talking about this? Um, the researchers don't know anything about the backend and we've come up with so many tools to support these policies and practices, but they haven't been user tested. The researchers don't care about specific features. It's like what you learn in product management is that only 70%, I think, of features are ever used in a product at one time. So we're investing so much resource into building out these technology things, but we're not talking about the researchers. And even in this room, it's great to all be on the same page, but we have already bought in. We agree that these things should be open. So where are we including the researchers? Um, and I've had this issue. I um, go to the UCs and do boot camps. Here's a series of them that were done. Uh, UCSF had 56 people sign up. They had 20 postdocs show up, which was great. No one showed up to Santa Cruz. No one showed up to bids. I think two people showed up there. And we asked the people at UCSF, 
why why did you show up and they said my pi made me which was great <laughs> and they showed up and then you did it but we've tried everything like we'll give you free food your funder requires that you come to this the nih tells you to come like all these things and if that's not enticing <laughs> and even if free food's not enticing grad students what is it what is this language how are we going to get these people to pay attention and there was a great talk this morning from Spark about having us invest in people and investing in the new wave of grad students coming in. Um, but how are we even going to entice them? So we have a disconnect. The language we're using isn't connecting, and the incentives are not apparent enough for the researchers. So to tackle this, I decided, all right, I'm not going to sit in this cube, I'm going to go out and I've been going to the campuses and buying any researcher who will talk to me coffee and asking them for sit down and talk to me. And I have no idea if they know anything about research data or publishing practices. They could be in a variety of levels. Uh, since it was not IRB approved, everything is just going to be random <laughs> quotes. <laughs> but I promise they're real quotes. So I started and I said, what terminology resonates with you? And a postdoc said, give me credit for my research. And I said, what terminology makes sense when I say repository? And a PI at Berkeley said, just use the word archive, which we all think is an old term. And then the PI was like, that's all I want to hear. Don't use the word preservation. Don't use the word repository. If you tell me to archive it, I'll put it there. We said, how would you describe your lab's <laughs> RDM practices? <laughs> and this is what I got. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think both of them are equally ridiculous and kind of shows how crazy the situation is that we're in right now. What motivates you? A, po a postdoc said, well, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> or nature papers. Um, and this came out of when I said, well, what about if I said, you can get a data citation when you open it up and you'll get 500 citations on it and you're going to know that there was 40 nature papers that you know, that cited it, does not look so much better, and they said, nope, just need that one nature paper. It may take me two years, but I'm not going to open up my data in the meantime. I said, would you publish your data? That's when another grad said, I'm not giving away three possible first author papers in this dream world that we're all living in, that <laughs> these grad students are going to get that, and that's really what's holding, holding them back. Um, a postdoc said, how is this any different than SI files? And that's where this whole, well, well then what are we saying publishing your data? Do people even know what we mean by this? Um, and a PI who is publishing their data a lot said, I'm hesitant to do it before publication because I still am not convinced that a DOI has recognized that I'm the first person who published out that work. Until people start citing it, I'm going to still hold on to it until I publish my papers. So what did we learn? We need to include researcher in these conversations because there's a massive disconnect between all of these resources we're putting energy into and all of these amazing discussions we're having, and yet those are the answers that we're getting when we think of the end user. So taking it back to what I'm doing day to day is Dash. And so this is a data publication platform um, that is really focused on adoption. That being said, we don't have massive adoption right now because <laughs> of everything I just showed. And so I'm spending more time trying to talk to researchers, going to individual labs, and trying to integrate data publishing into their workflow than actually just trying to talk about the tool. I'm really focused on pushing for data publishing in general and not trying to say, just use Dash. I need people to use Dash. Because if Dash doesn't work, that's OK. Really what we're just published, we're really trying to push for a change in the practices that we're seeing right now. And if that means people are going into any other repository, that's great. But just the more that we can see of people actually putting their research data out there, the better. So our goals have really been having the researcher needs drive development and integrating into the researcher workflows. So going out to these researchers in these interviews that I'm doing, I show them Dash and I say, what's one thing that would get you to use it? And then we put that in the backlog, and we see how many people are saying that, and that's how we prioritize what's <coughs> going to happen next. We are integrating into researcher workflows because we know the only way people are going to start publishing their data is if it's common practice. 
And that's the only reason that we've seen such an uptake in specific fields, because it's a standard, it's a common practice, it's a you have to, they're used to it. How, how are we doing this? As I mentioned, talking with as many people as possible. And some ways that we were able to integrate this, we put in a manifest upload, we're calling it. So instead of drag and drop, you just put in the URL for where your data are in the cloud or on a server, and then Dash goes in the back end and grabs it and publishes it for you. Uh, we're building out a submission API. So that means that there'll be more technological ways to get the data in. We're doing integrations with our um, OpenSci as well as Jupyter and online lab notebooks to actually be able to just be in your practice, right click, publish out your data, right click, version your data um, in ways that the researchers are actually working with it. So we think that, you know, just working with Box is, is really great, but actually are researchers even using Box? Where is the data right now? And just finding the best source and the easiest way for them to get their data in. Um, and we're also talking about UI integrations with publishers. So working with UC Press right now to be able to get that in. So when you hit the data availability statement, you could say publish with Dash and it would be a one click where it sends over all your metadata. So removing those additional barriers so that people can actually just, while they're publishing their article, make it that publishing your data is part of that practice. So communication with researchers is essential in this process. It's not fun. They might tell you they don't care what you're talking about. <laughs> but it can be really fun if you take it as, OK, I'm going to take that as a challenge, and we're going to make this happen. Um, and if we're going to build these services and tools in this community, we have to be including them. And we have to be able to hear what they're saying, even if they say, I don't like anything about this. I don't feel comfortable with this. And we need to iterate based on that researcher input and not just work within our own communities where we say, this is a technological practice, this is a standard, this is how GitHub is, but is that something a researcher actually values? That's what should be driving these conversations. Um, and I look forward to seeing how this will continue and what we kind of see in the next year as more of us are starting to get into this. So we'd love to hear about your experience or um, answer any questions or talk about why you disagree with us. <laughs> <laughs>